Men, on the other hand, when they view more pornography, tend to report lower relationship satisfaction, lower sexual satisfaction. And so this was a puzzle. It's like, well, what? You're listening to the In Your Pants podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Susie Gronsky, your penis-friendly pelvic health physical therapist, sex counselor, and educator, helping you get in the know down below. On today's show, we have guest Dr. Nicole Prousey, a neuroscientist and licensed psychologist who studies human motivation, especially the physiology of orgasm on the brain and the health effects of pornography. We discuss the workings of our brains and genitals during arousal and orgasm, highlighting the surprising similarities between genders and challenging long-held myths. How arousal challenges differ from orgasm challenges and strategies to overcome them. Dr. Prousey helps us better understand the sexual response cycle, contrasting the traditional linear model proposed by Masters and Johnson with more contemporary perspectives. We have a conversation about the effects of porn on sexual health, with Dr. Prousey challenging the use of terminology in mainstream media like pornography addiction, and the beliefs posed by anti-masturbation groups for pornography-related problems. Lastly, we discuss a rare condition that occurs mostly in men called post-orgasmic illness syndrome. Dr. Prousey sheds light on theories and her upcoming study that may support individuals experiencing illness-like symptoms post-orgasm. So let's dive into the world of intimate conversations right here on In Your Pants. Dr. Prousey, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on. Yes. So can you explain the science behind arousal and orgasm, specifically what happens in our brains and genitals, as well as any unique distinctions between genders? Okay, I'll hit all of it. <laughs> Let's see. The Generally speaking, when you start to get aroused initially, it means you have to notice that something is sexual So that may be more automatic for some things and more effortful or specific to you for others. You have to pay attention to it. You have to elaborate on it, what we say cognitively, that is not just see that it's there, but actually think about it, start to think about it as a sexual stimulus. And so your brain is engaged in a very effortful process. And at that point, the genital or peripheral arousal typically starts also when everything's working. As we get to higher and higher levels of arousal, there's to some extent, it's just more of the same. You know, we get more and more activation, but at some point there seems to be a switch that we're currently calling a periorgasmic period where the effort actually starts to decrease. So where we had sympathetic nervous system activation, so increased breathing rate, increased heart rate, increased galvanic skin response, which is a sweating response. Now that stuff starts to reverse. So this is not orgasm itself. This is just before the things become less effortful. This may be where people describe edging or a flow state and those kind of states. And climax, we don't actually know how it's triggered. It's still a bit of a mystery, but climax itself is a reflex. So kind of once it starts, you can't really stop it. And it's actually really well physiologically defined, although people obviously report experiencing it a lot of different ways. Awesome. And are there any unique distinctions between genders that you're aware of in your research? There are some surprising similarities and some differences. So people often think, oh, you know, women have all these multi-orgasmic capacities men don't have. Orgasm between the genders is actually very similar. Like if we look at the traces of contractions, we cannot tell genders apart. They have the same kind, same number, all of that good stuff. And when you actually have those contractions with climax, would they seem to have similar prolactin changes, for example, where they're quite different is when you ask Uh, men or women to judge their arousal. Most commonly, uh, men look down at their penis and so they report what they see. (laughs) They say, I am this much aroused. And women are judging a lot more things typically and kind of integrating information, not only from what their genitals are doing, but also the context they're in. If it's safe, you know, they think more about those kind of cues. So if anything, we often see women will have some genital response that we can document, but they don't report feeling aroused. So some people call that a lack of coherence or a discordant response between women, but I don't see it as necessarily anything wrong. It's just kind of how it is. 
Okay. Well, and that, so what I'm hearing is that physiologically, there's a lot of similarities, but subjectively mm -hmm. there, there are these differences between how we're weighing the, the experience, our sexual experience and what contexts are important. Although I would, I would say that context is important for everybody. <laughs> Of right. course, as the rule, there's more overlap than difference. But if you ask for difference, I can find them. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Awesome. Uh, well, this brings me to my next question, because I've heard you and other sexuality researchers challenge the traditional linear sexual response model that was first proposed by the researchers, uh, William Masters and Virginia Johnson in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Can you contrast this with the contemporary perspective derived from yours and other research? Um, and how does this contrast similarly or differently to the male sexual response cycle? It's funny, almost anyone who takes a human sexuality class, even in college today, is still taught this Masters and Johnson thing and literally has not been tested. Like that plateau phase, no one's made sure there's a plateau phase. Seems important. <laughs> so that was one of our uh, kind of recent contributions, as we said, we should probably see if that's a thing <laughs> that exists and if we can document it or what exactly that, that piece is. But before that, uh, so obviously there was this longstanding model, very linear, where it's like this needs to happen, then that needs to happen. This is the order of things. And uh, Helen Singer Kaplan came in and added a desire phase that was unique to her model. But that still was a long time ago. <laughs> and more recently, Rosemary Basson has suggested a model of female sexual response. If you look at it, um, it has a lot of arrows going everywhere and lots mm -hmm. of different ideas and constructs. Um, the good thing that came out of that is she talked about the differences in responsive uh, versus kind of initiating desire. So that's the extent to which somebody has spontaneous urges to be sexual. And she said, this is something men have a lot more of and women's desire tends to be more responsive. And so there's a lot of research around that now, but the model itself is almost untestable. Like the way that it's kind of made, it's very complex and there are kind of feedback loops that really can't be easily taken apart. Mm -hmm. So it's useful kind of to think about those concepts, but from a science perspective, it's very difficult to support her model because it's not really testable. Uh, aspects of it are, but not the, the kind of whole thing. So now we're kind of in this limbo, <laughs> you know, we're in between, we've got linear models that we're like, we want the good stuff out of those. <laughs> what we don't want is like to have good sex, you must have this, then you right. must have, this. then this thing must occur. Uh, we really want to try and help people get away from that framework while still saying that there is some physiological basis. <laughs> like these things do have some linearity, like generally to have climax, uh, you know, with some very unique exceptions. It doesn't just happen. <laughs> you know, it's like there's a process generally that needs to occur before that to help potentiate the likelihood of it happening. So it's still very much a balance, you know, we're trying to work on with these models. Mm, so if you had to summar summarize the, the, the potential or new proposed updated model, mm -hmm. like how would you describe that to someone who's new or, or just newly learning these, these concepts or models? I think the most important thing we're starting to modify from the Masters and Johnson model is when you start to get more and more and more aroused, we always kind of thought, well, you just need more of whatever that is to get to climax. And we seem to see now that that is not the case. Like there's a unique, distinct brain body state that occurs between high arousal and the initiation of orgasm that can be easily seen physiologically. And we're not sure exactly what the function is. We have some ideas. But that suggests if you're having trouble with arousal, but not orgasm, if you're having trouble uh, with orgasm, but not arousal, there may be reasons for that. These seem to be very different kind of processes. And so it makes sense that you may struggle in one area and not the other. And what might some of those reasons be if you compare the both, like or having difficult mm -hmm. orgasming, but not with arousal and then vice versa? So if this periorgasmic state thing is real, <laughs> which we think it is, obviously I wouldn't mention it, but... Um, if you had trouble with arousal, I may think, uh, but orgasm was fine. Like once you get turned on, you can usually get there. Then I would think this person is someone I want to help uh, their focus to be able to notice when things are sexual, to elaborate and think about those, fantasize about them, become engaged with them. I, I suspect they struggle more in that space. If you don't have trouble getting turned on, but you can't get over the hump, you know, you're like, where is my climax? <laughs> you know what's right. happening. 
then I would think this person, they're getting aroused just fine, but they're having trouble reducing the cognitive control that we think allows the climax to occur. So we may have this person try and hyperventilate in a safe way where they're not going to fall. Uh, we may uh, have them do things to try and alter their perception of their space. So trying to get to these very high arousal states. Uh, you can even now, uh, some of the tools we use in the lab called galvanic skin response, you can buy these pretty cheaply for your iPhone if you have that and uh, monitor your own galvanic skin response and see you know it's going up, but it needs to be coming back down before you can expect a climax. So you can even do biofeedback potentially to see what is my body doing? Like, am I getting there? Am I seeing that pattern that uh, should help potentiate the climax? So that person uh, who's struggling with climax, I'm not going to worry as much about like, oh, let's get you just, you, we used to say, oh, you just need a stronger vibrator. Mm. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, that may be the case for some folks, but probably not. Uh, you know, it, it really seems to be a really unique state that we have to figure out a way to get people to almost disconnect a little bit from the stimulus they're experiencing once it's sufficient. And we don't know what sufficient is yet. We're working on it. <laughs> but um, but they're, they seem to be really distinct problems for a good reason. Oh, that's interesting. So it sounds to me like you, 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 the second piece, the difficulty getting to the climax, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm, what I'm hearing you say is there's this, and if I'm understanding correctly, so this is me just processing as well. Yeah. But so there's this space between, you know, that, you know, getting to the climax where it's, it's not just, it doesn't end at the peak. What you're saying is there has to be some coming down from that heightened state of, of stimulation is, is, and I'm getting that correctly. There's a space in between that, that uh, before the climax. So yes. it's actually like, yeah, for several minutes. And so it's not just like sometimes people have heard the phrase ejaculatory inevitability. And that yeah. basically means the climax has started. I mean, that's that's not what we're talking about. This is, uh, in women, we see this state can go on for many minutes. So it's, uh, we came across it by accident because of the way we'd set up our protocol. We wanted to see an arousal process and then see uh, them trying to have an orgasm. And so we had women like get aroused in the lab and then said, okay, try to have a climax if you can press the button when your climax either starts or you want to tap out. <laughs> and, uh, so they would start to try and we're like, whoa, did the sensor fall out? Like the crazy shift in response. And we're like, this is actually really distinct and unique and we need to understand what this is. And now we see it's really replicable. It's a really large effect um, as far as we can tell, but it, it lasts for quite a long time. And so that's why I think this might be what people are talking about when they say edging. You know, that's having a very high kind of altered uh, feeling of the space mm -hmm. that it may be that uh, brain state, whatever that is that we're still working on characterizing. Right. I was just going to ask you that, like, what are some of the qualities and characteristics of being in this state that people have described or that you've observed? The clearest one is a shift in alpha uh, response. So alpha in electroencephalography, so EEG is brainwave data. Mm -hmm. And the, the rule of thumb is EEG is very good at things in time. Uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI is really good at things in space. So both measures do. The other thing also, you know, fMRI goes over time and EEG can model things in where it's happening in the brain but they're better at their respective things. <laughs> so EEG is very good at time. And when we look at the different frequencies within the EEG brain waves, there's some between eight and 13 Hertz or cycles per second that uh, is commonly referred to as alpha. Nothing special to somebody stick that label on there a long time ago. <laughs> and it's very easy to manipulate. So for example, to make sure that the thing is recording properly, we may have people close their eyes and open their eyes. When you close your eyes, your alpha goes up, open your eyes, your alpha goes down. So alpha broadly is thought of as an index of almost cortical idling. So when you're watching television, you kind of space out, you don't even remember what was on the last couple of minutes, your alpha was probably high. <laughs> so it's not that exact state, mm -hmm. but that is typical of a high alpha state. So when you start to get aroused, your alpha is strongly suppressed because you're focusing, you're Mm -hmm. engaging in effortful attention to make this thing happen for your genitals. And uh, later on in this periorgasmic state, the alpha starts to rise noticeably. So it seems like you're actually reducing the control a little bit and saying, you know, I don't need to engage in this effort. Now I'm riding the sensation. Mm, it's riding that. So that's what you're talking about, this flow state of... of... I think so. That's our suspicion. Yeah. That's, and, and this is similar between genders? 
we have seen it in men, but we have far fewer data in men. We were recruiting for a male study of orgasm in March, uh, right as COVID started and our lab closed. <laughs> so, oh. so we now have all this uh, great grant funding and we are trying to get restarted. We are so <laughs> close. Um, so hopefully we'll have better data. We have just a few men right now where we've observed it in men, but because their latency is so much shorter. Mm -hmm. So when we ask them to climax, they can do so pretty quickly. We have a much shorter time window to kind of see that state in men. So we have a protocol now that we think is going to allow us to see that a little more if it exists. But uh, we we do think it's there <laughs> for guys also, but our suspicion is it's just much shorter. Yeah. Okay. And so you mentioned hyperventil like safely hyperventilating in mm -hmm. order to help stimulate the state. Are there any other strategies that would be helpful as well to kind of get into this state that someone could do? I mean, literally closing your eyes increases alpha. <laughs> so it's the things that you may think of that kind of help you uh, check out and focus on sensation. So for example, I suspect that some of these mindfulness exercises that are becoming more popular mm -hmm. and to the extent that they help you just feel the sensation and kind of ride more than like trying to force something mm -hmm. or get it to go somewhere is like to just experience, just feel, you know, if mm -hmm. you think about those kind of intentions or instructions, mm -hmm. those should help increase alpha as well. So the uh, hyperventilation is kind of a hack <laughs> more so than anything of, uh, what can we do for someone who may struggle with that? So the yeah. hyperventilation is more bottom up, whereas mm -hmm. the mindfulness or focus shift is more of a top down. You know, okay. like, get to that state. That reminds me of like, have you heard of the Wim Hof breathing methods that use, you know, cold therapy, but also this very mm -hmm. uh, fast breathing, but then slow breathing, you're kind of playing with your breath. Uh, hmm. with stress response states. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of. No, we do a lot of like stress breathing, square breathing yeah. and stuff in okay. therapy. So I don't know that one. But. Yeah. Okay. It sounds very, it sounds very similar or one way to train in, in the ways that you're, you're describing uh, with the physiological stress response mechanism mm -hmm. in general. So that's cool. Awesome. That's really cool. So this is a a great segue into the next question I have around pornography, which I, we all know is a very controversial topic these days. <laughs> But what what this is triggering for me in my mind is that, you know, when you close your eyes, you can ride your sensations and be within and, and kind of go with the flow. This, this reminds me of those that have difficulty reaching climax. And I'm, I'm speaking particularly uh, for men. Uh, maybe they have uh, difficulty, you know, getting to orgasm, but they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, um, using pornography and they're, vi you know, visually that's very stimulating. And they're very aroused. If closing their eye, like could, well, I have many questions about pornography, but could pornography be a distraction in that moment if, if they're having difficulty reaching climax? Um, and also would love to get your, your opinion about the effects of pornography in general on sexual health and well-being. So the first part you're saying, like, if they're actually having sex with someone and trying to view porn at the same time, or you mean that during masturbation? Individual during masturbation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. Pornography can have interesting different effects depending how it's used. And this is some of our questions is we, when someone's viewing pornography, they could be doing a lot of different things with it. They could be imagining themselves as one of the characters in the, what's going on, imagining that person being touched that way as you being touched that way that kind of identification appears to facilitate sexual arousal when you're viewing pornography, um, or you could be using it as a springboard for recall. So I see them doing that. I remember when I did that with this partner who I really cared about, and that reminds me of all these other things. So we really don't know to what extent people are engaged in the image that they're seeing uh, and identifying with characters versus using that as a springboard for fantasy. And it probably varies. You know, some people probably use it more one way than another. So from that, you know, one is uh, the pornography is probably not that distracting because they're not really engaging with the stimulus itself. Whereas I could imagine if you're putting yourself in that space, then it's quite consuming and, right. uh, and, and may make that more difficult. So I could see, you know, if you're having difficulty experiencing climax while you're watching pornography, it may be worth playing with the experience, kind of how you're engaged with it. Uh, as you mentioned, closing eyes, like using that as audio erotica. So some people that object to the content of pornography 
uh, will still enjoy the audio sometimes just by using the sounds and imagining something that is appealing to them occurring rather than the specifics of what, you know, like if they feel like they see pain on women's faces, for example, they may not want to see that. And mm -hmm. so I'm just going to close my eyes and imagine her face as I would love it to be. <laughs> you know? So there may be strategies for uh, kind of using it in a more effective way. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly because we're not totally sure how porn is used in the moment. I would love to know more about that myself um, for science. <laughs> the, the general question, how pornography affects sexual health in general, uh, it's varied and it depends on the person. So, for example, I when you watch, people often have a knee jerk like, oh, Oh, that's terrible. You know, like kids are watching. It is illegal here. Uh, youth cannot watch. <laughs> They're not supposed to. Uh, when they do, it's a bit of a mixed bag so in the sense that the youth who watch do tend to have more accurate genital knowledge. They know more about where a clitoris is. Mm -hmm. um, people who view clitoral stimulation and erotica tend to also be more likely to do it themselves, which is important for women's arousal. So you could say, well, that's probably good for them to learn to do that and <laughs> to, to attend to that. However, <laughs> there is also a lot portrayed that they may not understand the context for or know how to ask for consent to do those acts. And so, of course, you know, when youth view, uh, overwhelmingly, we just don't know what the effects are because we can't do the experimental work that would be necessary to show that because we'd have to experimentally show children pornography, super illegal, very much in jail after doing that, if you did that, so... Um, so for the most part, there's a lot of panic, but we just don't know. We don't have data around that. Um, otherwise, the, there's a huge gender effect. So when women view more pornography, um, whether they're in a relationship context or not, it seems to be largely beneficial. They report more sexual satisfaction, more relationship satisfaction, even when they personally view more pornography. It also matters if they're disclosing. So if they're keeping it a secret from their partner, it's more likely to be a negative uh, correlation. If they're disclosing to their partner, it's more likely to be positive. If they're co-watching, very likely to be positive. Men, on the other hand, <laughs> when they view more pornography, tend to report lower relationship satisfaction, lower sexual satisfaction. And so this was a puzzle. It's like, well, what is happening? Like they have the same brain. That's <laughs> interesting. Be, very yeah. interesting. So the best explanation I've seen for it so far is really porn is primarily for masturbation, sometimes used for education, sometimes used to co-view, overwhelmingly used for masturbation. And the genders use masturbation very differently. And so I think it's just reflecting that. So men tend to use masturbation. And when I say 10, I mean, again, huge overlap. We're talking very average. You may not fit this. But um, in general, men tend to use masturbation in a compensatory way and women tend to use it in an enhancing way. So in a relationship, men uh, may view pornography because their partner turned them down for sex, because they had a fight with their partner, because their drive is higher than their partner and they don't know any other way to balance it and don't have an open relationship and don't have any you know thing else that might permit those kind of outfits. Uh, and they are more likely to hide it from their partner to hide their use. Um, whereas women uh, tend to use masturbation in this enhancing way. So they're using it to get excited so that they will have sex with their partner or so that they're uh, better able to bring themselves to climax more easily. So that makes the sex itself more reinforcing and enhancing. So my guess is it's not really a pornography effect. It's probably more due to just how men and women use masturbation differently. But I always think it's interesting when they say all oh, these negative effects, I was like, Sure, if you only talk to men, <laughs> you may have that impression, but you need to think about the context of how it's being used. Right. That really matters. So mm -hmm. we did a study, for example, people worry if you view a lot of pornography, you're not going to be responsive to your partner anymore. That is definitely not true. We have studied that in the brain. We have studied it with real partners. We have studied it with erections. We have like, we've done the laboratory work. I am not worried about that. Um, by and large, people who view more pornography do so because they have a higher sex drive so if they could have sex with you they would <laughs> generally speaking um so that's one thing it doesn't you know blow out your dopamine receptors is something common mm -hmm. i've heard or yes yeah 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 cause a dopamine flood there's actually no increase in dopamine at climax fyi <laughs> so mm -hmm. there are just lots and lots of myths around 
pornography and all the the trouble it could cause. But I think it really matters a lot the context. You know, like does your partner approve of your use? Are you open about your use? Uh, in what way are you using it? Is it your use due to conflict? <laughs> does my partner want to have sex with me because we're fighting? Yeah, then you're gonna have a lower relationship satisfaction and be masturbating more. <laughs> so. Um, so I really want to see that context brought into research and we just don't see a lot of that yet. Mm. And what are your thoughts around, and you kind of mentioned this a little bit about like dopamine reward centers, you know, tapping mm-hmm. into this conversation around pornography addiction, like mm-hmm. from a physiological perspective, you know, what does the research say about that? And I, and I'm already gathering like in, intent and engagement and, and the context around use really matters and, and the effect on your overall you know, relationship and, and the rest of your life really, um, to, to make that determination. But I'd love to hear more mm-hmm. about your thoughts. Sure. The pornography is not recognized as an addiction currently by any diagnostic nomenclature in the U S or elsewhere. That's a, a common myth, but people do recognize pornography problems and it occurs in all kinds of contexts. So some people who are depressed, uh, use pornography more than is healthy for them and use it to isolate themselves, to not go out, to not date, because they kind of find that an outlet instead. And that's probably not great for uh, the way it's sometimes used. Other folks uh, may have obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, may use it compulsively in the context of OCD. So the way I think about it is the for something to be called an addiction scientifically, it actually is a really high bar. It has to meet all these different criteria And there are things that it cannot be that have to be excluded. And so almost all the work around pornography has been kind of replicating stuff we already knew 40 years ago, frankly, that just shows like, oh, porn activates the reward center, right? (laughs) Okay. And they're like, that's the same thing cocaine does, like, right? And other rewards like spending time with friends and other rewards like seeing pictures of puppies and like... So is it does need to be there to call something an addiction, um, but it is not sufficiently specific to offer much evidence. So we say, well, then what, what is this? Like, how do we think about this? If somebody says, I feel like I'm watching too much. Um, first of all, we can absolutely help with just that behavior. There are interventions to help people uh, decrease their television viewing. And guess what? Viewing a lot of televisions also associated with obesity, you know, it has other uh, negative associations. Or someone might just want to decrease their viewing just because they want to decrease their viewing. And that's totally fine. We don't need to pathologize it or give it a label just to be helpful and intervene there. But my suspicion is really, there's a really, really poor, what we call discriminant validity with pornography problems. So that is to show that something is a new diagnosis or needs to have its own label. Uh, you have to show that it is not something that we already know about. Mm. And when we look at people who have pornography uh, problems, they overwhelmingly have a lifetime history of depression or a current uh, history with depression. So that's the most common overlap by far. The Another one is alcohol abuse problems. So people, when they're uh, abusing alcohol, often will engage in these types of sexual behaviors also and, and understand and label them in that way. But I think that's probably better understood in the context of their alcohol mm-hmm. use. So that's where I uh, have been pushing back a lot and and get pushed back is to say, like, I don't think this is really a new entity. I think we're trying to make something uh, into a newfangled thing that we want to, you know, think we've got the lock on this sexy new topic. And really, it's just a manifestation of things we already know. And it would be more helpful if we kind of understood it in that context and treated it in the ways of these uh, interventions, like for depression, we have so many good interventions, right. so many research supported interventions. I would so much rather see these folks helped with depression interventions that I think uh, are likely to be helpful. In fact, there already was one trial that took in people who said they had these sexually compulsive behavior and just gave them a depression treatment and they all improved. And I was like, okay, so <laughs> can we? It doesn't have say, to be that complex, right? <laughs> yeah. It's obviously, not everyone is just depressed instead. Uh, but I think a lot of them are, sure. is my suspicion. Sure. Where do you think that this, uh, and I'm um, thank you so much for educating me on, on pornography problems rather than pornography addiction, because that's something you don't hear in the, in, in social media and mainstream, mm-hmm. language, uh, even in, in educational curriculum, to be honest, uh, even around sexuality curriculum. 
it, it, it's not defined in the in, in quite the elegant way that you have really and logical way that says, hey, this is really what we're dealing with. <laughs> and let's not pathologize something that isn't a pathology. There are other things contributing to a particular behavior and intent of use. And I, and I love that. So I really appreciate that. So thank you. And, and my site, my question to that is, where do you, why do you think, where do you think this came from or stemmed from as far as this whole controversy around, you know, addiction around pornography and et cetera? There seem to be kind of three bodies that are pushing this right now, none of which are scientific. So there were some early papers written about a coalition between religious groups and feminists, which is pretty unusual. They don't normally get along, but in this context, they do. So in general, there are lots of religious groups that are still anti-masturbation. You know, they don't think you should be self-pleasuring and certainly not looking at pornography. So they're anti-pornography and they really want to co-opt the health language and say, no, 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 it's not that we're moral judges. It's that it's bad for you. You know, we're just here for your health. And we're like, no, no, no. We know where you're from. <laughs> like, <laughs> we know how this works. We've seen this before. Uh, and then the feminists, you know, there's a huge split in the feminist um, groups. There always has been some that find pornography empowering for women and others that find it degrading. And so those feminists that believe that it's degrading to women have partnered with the religious groups now and around this particular issue. And so I said, there's three groups. The third that's come in in the last 10 years is guys looking to make money. So they come in and they say, you have a pornography addiction and I alone can fix it if you give me money. And so they've come up with all of these like online tests that have no scientific basis and these uh, abstinence treatments where you have to abstain from masturbation, porn and orgasm for 90 days. And that'll reset your brain back. They literally say back to factory settings, which is not possible by the way. So don't do that. Um, <laughs> but they, they're often coaches is how they describe themselves. And usually their only qualifications is that they claim they experienced it themselves. So now they, these three groups work together. It's like the religious groups and these anti-porn feminists and these profiting coaches are all saying porn, is, porn addiction is real, porn addiction is real because they make money off of it right. uh, like crazy in the, the mm -hmm. most recent case. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to fight right now. The most popular male sexual health topic on both Instagram and TikTok uh, is semen retention or NoFap. Yes, so these, you just read my mind. I was going to ask yeah. you about that. Yeah. Uh, and that's why they're selling a product. So these guys have just taken over social media and we do research on these groups. We scrape their forums. And one of the problems we have, because you know, we're regulated in terms of the research we do, we have to meet ethical requirements is they don't want us to study kids, but these are anonymous online accounts. And so it's difficult for us to know if they are children. And so we do our best to get them out. But that's part of the trouble is when we started scraping these forums, we're like, this is overwhelmingly children. <laughs> like this, wow. We couldn't use so much of the data. We had to throw quite a lot out and be careful, you know, of kind of who and how we were getting our information, our data. Mm -hmm. So my read is a lot of these are really young guys who are just learning about their sexuality, having their first sexual partnered sexual experiences. And they have very typical anxiety around this. And these guys are very happy to lie to them and say, oh, you have erectile dysfunction because they, you know, had trouble getting hard with their first ever partner. I was like, no, 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 no. that's not ED. That's, that's anxiety. <laughs> very, very common. It's fine. It's going to be okay. You do not need a coach. You should not pay anyone. <laughs> yes. So, uh, so we see all these posts that just break my heart. You know, it's uh, these folks that are really being misled in kind of their developing sexuality to think they have a a problem that they need help with, that their brain has been forever scarred. Mm. And I just think, guys, I know it's tough out there. It's embarrassing sometimes and you don't always know what's going on, but most likely you're going to be fine. And I wish I could just uh, get them to some good education when I see those posts, but we are fighting a very well-funded, uh, highly motivated group that uh, with between the three of them are really, really active in legislative efforts and all kinds of things to try and you know, sway the, the public in ways that scientists don't often engage. You know, we're publishing papers and maybe right. helping one-on-one -on -one in the clinic. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Oh my goodness. That is so enlightening and also scary at the same time. Like yeah, I really sad for these. these yeah, kids. it is. And the advice you just, just gave is practical. It's free. It's biologically <laughs> sensible. It's, you know, I mean, but that doesn't sell, like you said, it's not, 
you, you, you can't sell, you can't sell that, you know? Yeah. Every, I always joke. I say, I feel like most of my career is like, everything's fine. Stop it. It's yes. fine. <laughs> like, Put that on, the, on a t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> everything's fine. Stop yeah. it on the, on the back. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> love it. Dr. Prowsey. Well that, okay. So I, I, we're going to segue here a little bit to a different topic if, if I may. Mm-hmm. Because you have an upcoming study, um, a little birdie told me about an upcoming study uh, about post-orgasmic illness syndrome. And, mm-hmm. and I'd love for you to just uh, share with us what that is and uh, a little teaser about this study. We were interested in post-orgasmic illness syndrome or POIS because there seems to be a small group of primarily but not only men who experience this where every time they have an ejaculation, an orgasm by any means, it doesn't matter if it's partner or solo, they have flu-like symptoms for two to seven days afterwards. Now, these guys are highly motivated and that does not stop them. <laughs> they usually are still sexually active or they have partners you know, who want to be intimate. And so they're struggling and trying to figure out what is happening with me. And because this is so rare, it's not a well-funded area of study. So we were thrilled to get funding from the National Organization of Rare Disorders, or NORD, and also some from the Fulton Family Foundation to do this work. And we're funded to look at over 100 men in the laboratory, uh, some of which have this condition, POIS, and some of which are what we call controls, that is, they don't have any known um, POIS or other sexual dysfunction. And to compare especially their inflammatory cytokines before and after climax. Mm -hmm. So that means we have to provoke climax in the lab. So we're having them masturbate uh, in the lab. We take blood samples. We take saliva. We're getting their EEG. We're getting anal contractions. We are getting all the things. So you can imagine this is a psychophysiologist's dream (laughs) to get all of these data And some of them, we really don't have any information on the inflammatory markers we're getting have never been recorded in post-climax before. So Mm -hmm. some of this is really basic science. It's stuff we should know by now (laughs) that uh, we can't wait to get and see how that turns out. And of course, the main hope is to help these guys to figure out what might be going on. That's, it was a longstanding theory that it may be an auto ejaculate, uh, autoimmune response to the ejaculate content. So there was something in their ejaculate that they're Mm -hmm. having an allergic response to. And in that vein, some of the treatments were doing like auto inoculation where they would inject their ejaculate back into themselves. And that turns out probably not to be the case. Um, And the auto inoculations don't seem like a great idea. So I I wouldn't do that as first line if you're having that struggle. Right. But we're really trying to figure out what is it exactly that's going on. And so some of that earlier research I mentioned, looking at like the periorgasmic period is part of that puzzle and saying, is it something dysregulated in the sympathetic nervous system? Is it something like, what is it that's different about these guys um, that when they get over that hump, their body thinks they're sick and starts launching all of these things to, to try and help them get better. So it's clearly something is misfiring <laughs> and we're trying to figure out what that is. Do we know if there are any overlapping other health comorbidities or conditions that correlate with, you know, post-orgasmic illness syndrome? There have been a number of studies that have found a bunch of different overlapping symptom syndromes and none stand out. So it does seem like something where uh, you know, to be fair, you always have to rule out the potential for psychosomatic concerns. That is something that they've worried themselves sick is one way of uh, colloquially putting that. Um, we don't think that's the case or we wouldn't be collecting the measures we are, but we always have to rule that out. And so some of the syndromes may be related to some of that. So it may be that some guys are having that kind of an issue or concern, but the others are having, you know, a really different kind of physical response. So we are looking for those kind of things just to be sure. So we can rule them out, but I don't know what the, uh, like another prominent kind of comorbidity is that really stands out to me. I've seen a number reported in different uh, kind of case reports. These, these are all usually also very typically small samples because rare disorder. <laughs> so. Exactly. And I'm imagining that even just diagnostic criteria are very slim of how to even recognize what those would be other than subjective symptoms. Mm-hmm. That was exactly, we had to 
go through the literature and see what is being used and what seems most reliable and what do we think people can accurately report. And that is one nice thing, at least, is flu-like symptoms are pretty stark. And some guys will say, right after I climax, I start sneezing. It's, it's the weirdest thing. <laughs> it's a, I don't have you know change of that normally or within 24 hours, I'm going to be sniffling and I know it. So one thing that is nice about it is the symptoms are high, seem highly specific. Like if you're having them, you know, and you're not wondering. Right. <laughs> and they, they seem to usually be pretty profound in the guys who are struggling with this. Right. Oh, it'll be so interesting to see what the data says as far as the it's, markers that you're going to collect. Uh, I am extra mad at COVID <laughs> because oh. it closed our study right <laughs> as we started. So it's back on the table. It. It's back yeah. on the table, guys. Yeah. We're going to get it. We're going to get it. But uh, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Prowsey. Yes. So, and your research team, of course. I, I'm sure there's many others who are part of this venture and all the work that you do. Thank you so much. And, and really, I really do appreciate you being on the show today with us. For our viewers and our listeners out there, how can I connect with you? Our website is LibrosCenter, L I B E R O S Center.com, or I have what's known as a ResearchGate account. If you're curious about scientific papers, I'm always happy to share those with anyone who likes them uh, to grab them from ResearchGate, no problem. Thank you so much. Again, really appreciate you being on the show and to all of our viewers and listeners there and loving wellness for your pelvis. This is Dr. Susie. Until next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to visit my website, drsuzyg.com, for show notes and related resources on today's topic. If you like what you're hearing, head on over to YouTube and subscribe to my channel. On my YouTube channel, you'll find content related to sex, pelvic health, and expert interviews for men. If you got a question or a topic that you'd like me to answer on my channel, be sure to type it in the comment box below.